Okay, we're going to take a look at Battle Hymn Volume 1, which is the battles of Gettysburg and Pea Ridge. And it was designed by that prolific designer, Eric Lee Smith. He's the man who gave us the great game, The Civil War, back in the 80s. And it's published by Compass Games. And uh, I must say the Compass Games have done an excellent job on this game. Beautiful maps, beautiful counters, and Eric has come up with just a great brigade level system for the Civil War. I've been wanting a brigade level system on the Civil War for quite a long time. I did try the brigade level series from the gamers, but it really wasn't my cup of tea. The last really good brigade level game that I really enjoyed was Gettysburg 77. So it's about time someone came up with a brigade level system, and I think this just may be the one for me. This is the Pea Ridge map. Uh, I like the way it looks. It uh, looks like those old time maps done back in the uh, 19th century. But the, we're going to concentrate on Gettysburg today. And to show off the system, I think the best way to do is do a playthrough. So I'll shoot, oh, I don't know, half hour of footage. I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. And uh, just to show you how elegant this system really is. Okay, rather than just show you the map and the pieces, I thought the best way to... Uh, show off the game would be to do a playthrough. So I've put the map underneath some plastics here. That's where that line is there. There's two plastics. All your charts are on the uh, map, which is nice. A very large turn record chart. And your terrain key over here, where you put shattered Union units, and a table for unique combat situations. So we're going to start the game, and uh, the July 1st 7 a.m. turn and I'll try to comment on the game as I play it. I think that's the best way to show off this very excellent system. Okay, Eric has come up with this chit pull system which I understand he um, first started with his game Across Five Aprils which universally got some very good reviews. A game I never owned because it was out of print and I just uh, couldn't get my hands on it. So this is the logical progression of that system. Now the best way to sort the counters for this game is actually by turn arrival. Because, as you'll see, that's kind of the way the game works. Many Gettysburg games, you sort the uh, counters by core. That's fine, too. But I think if you uh, do it by turn arrival, you'll find it uh, much simpler. So, we'll take the pieces out for turns one and two, and uh, we'll show you what it's all about. Before we start the game, I should mention something about the battle manuals. You get a manual of standard rules and a manual of the special rules for Gettysburg and Pea Ridge. And the manuals are just beautiful. They're illustrated in full color. And I must say that these rules are about the finest set of rules I've read in war games for in years. They were very, very clear. Now, despite that, I had to go on Consum to get a few clarifications and uh, once I set up the game, it all came very clear. So I, I recommend if you get the game, read the rules, and set up the game. Everything will fall into place. You also get these very good, high-quality um, cardstock charts, and uh, they, they give you a number of them. So Compass has gone all out on this game, and as we'll see, the counters look beautiful too. So let's uh, show you a recommended uh, setup Okay, as I mentioned, the best way to set up the game is to actually put the counters that are due on those turns right on the turn. So, on turn one, you're going to have this 1st Corps Reynolds marker, Heath's Division marker, and the brigades of Archer and Davis. The Iron Brigade and Cutler come on, and, of course, Devon and Gamble and Caleb's Battery are already on the board. And I'm facing the units this way for the purposes of the video. If you're playing a game, uh, with an opponent, of course, the units would look like that. So, what you do uh, is take these leader counters, in this case, Heath and Reynolds, and you take the combat turn chit. These are not leader counters, as I found out when I set up. They're actually um, formation counters. And what you do is put those formation counters for turn one into an opaque container. I chose this one because it's got nice smooth edges and you can shake it and just grab a chit. So it's, it's a blind chit system. Let's see how this goes. Now in the scenario setup, they mentioned that neither side has the initiative at the beginning. 
and the uh, Confederates gain the initiative on uh, turn 8. So what we'll do is put a little initiative marker there on turn 8 to remind us of that fact. So we've put all the chits into the into the bucket there and I'll randomly draw one and uh, we'll see how it goes. I should mention that I've decided to dismount Devin and Gamble. You put a little wee dismounted cavalry marker on them, A, and then you take your horse marker here corresponding to the same letter. And they have to be within nine moving points of the cavalry unit and hidden to the Confederates, which they are. So there's advantages to being dismounted. Of course the cavalry then acts like infantry. It doesn't get a negative modifier when it fires. So let's pick our first chit and see what happens. Shovel up the chits, and we've pulled Heath's division, and that means that the two units of Heath's division come onto the board at B and can move. Let's catch the action after they've moved. Okay, after you pull the chit, you just set it aside, then you move the units corresponding to that commander, or formation commander. And we've moved Davis and Archer up the Chambersburg Pike, as we've seen in so many other games. Uh, the troops must arrive in what uh, Eric calls a conga line. In other words, the first unit pays one movement point, the second unit pays two movement points to come on the board. The third figure, of course, is the movement factor of nine. That's their combat value. So Davis has just reached the crest of Hers Ridge, and, of course, they're now in sight of Devon and Gamble and Caleb's battery. But there's no combat in this game until you draw the combat chit. Let's draw another chit and see what we get. We've drawn a combat chit. Well, this means that the Confederates would do combat, but in this case, Davis and Archer are not in combat range, so there is no combat for the Confederate. Okay, we draw another chit. There's only two left in there. We draw, and it's the first corps under Reynolds. Now Reynolds has a couple of brigades that are coming on. The good old Iron Brigade and Cutler. Let's set them up and see where they go. Now you may note on the counter that the turn of arrival is right on the counter itself. One, meaning turn one, and A, they come in from entry area A. And these are part of the first corps. Since we pulled Reynolds chit, that's why they're coming on. So we'll move the Iron Brigade up the road first. Why the Iron Brigade first? Well, it's got the best morale. You can see it's plus three in the middle. So we'll move it up the road, and uh, Cutler will follow. So we're up past Warfield Ridge, and that's the Union move. And there's only one chit left in the cup, and of course that's the combat turn, which means the Union can have combat. Now, there's nobody adjacent, but there is Caleb's battery. And the long-range artillery in this game, I really, really like the way Eric has done it. Many games on Gettysburg, the artillery is just too darn powerful. They're firing at three or four hexes range, they roll a die, and entire brigades are eliminated. That just doesn't happen in this game. But, Caleb does have a shot. It's within range and line of sight of Davis. So let's do that combat, and I'll show you what can happen. Now when Caliph fires at Davis, we note the terrain that Davis is in. And he's in clear terrain right now. And to hit Davis, you'd have to roll five or less on a ten-sided dice. Okay. But when you check the artillery range chart, Caleb is firing at extreme range, and it's he's only a single battery. This isn't a whole battalion. So he's negative five to the two-hit modifier which virtually means he has to roll a zero. But in this game, a one is always a hit, and a zero is um, always a miss. Zero in this game is ten. So we'll roll one die, see what Cash gets, and lo and behold, lucky devil that he is, he gets a one. Handy for the, uh, for the uh, video. So what does that mean? Let's find out. Okay, when you hit a fellow, you temporarily put a little wee hit marker on him, and then Davis has to roll his morale. So he rolls a die, and we'll check the morale table. Okay, the morale table is pretty basic. One through five, you fail. Six through ten, you succeed. So Davis rolls a two, which means he fails. What does that mean? 
Well, in a bombardment, when you check the rules and you fail your morale, hits become disorganization or demoralized points. So what you do is you take off the hit marker and replace it with a DM counter and you place that under Davis. That was a very fortunate shot by Caliph, but it does great for illustrating the game system how it works. Now, when you get a DM, they're not, they're not destroyed, they're demoralized. So it's as if Davis really has seven as a combat strength because there's a chance these men will come back. So uh, that's how combat works. And with the picking of the last chit in the pot there, we go on to turn two. On turn two, you'll be adding the leaders here and these new units and also Pleasanton will arrive, uh, will go in the chit pool. So you're going to be putting these two new uh, chits in the pool and these fellows will arrive at the edge of the board when their chit is pulled. So now we've got in the chit pool seven chits where before we only had what three so you drop those seven chits into the pool and uh, we do it all again so there in the turn track are the units that will potentially come on when the appropriate chit is drawn each turn by the way represents one hour and fifteen minutes on july first and on july second the time scale changes to one hour and a half uh, you can read the designer's notes as to why he did that, um, but it makes perfect sense to me. So our chits are in the pool there. We'll shake them up, draw the first chit, and we get the Cavalry Corps under Pleasanton, which means all of the cavalry units under Pleasanton can move. Let me just take a look at the situation here and then we'll decide what uh, Devin and Gamble want to do. Well. You've got some decisions here. You've got Devon and Gamble dismounted. Now Davis and Archer could easily come up the road here and close on the Union player. And uh, that would put two infantry brigades in primary range of cavalry. True, they're dismounted, but um, I'd rather preserve Devon and Gamble, so I'm going to um, probably mount up and fall back, or just fall back. Let's uh, catch the action after I've moved Devon and Gamble. Okay, I decided to keep Devon and Gamble dismounted. They fell back to uh, McPherson's Ridge, or just behind it, Seminary Ridge rather, and uh, the horse holders are behind them, and Caliph is over here on the Union left. Now you might notice that I haven't stacked any units. That's one thing I love about this game. There is no stacking in the game. None at all. And uh, makes for a very clean and smooth system. So that's the situation at 8.15. Let's pick the next chit and see what happens. Okay, the next chit pull is a combat turn, similar to our last one. When you pull a combat turn, that means the Union, because it's the Union chit, can have combat. Now in this case the situation is a little bit different because uh, the Union is far enough back, and I don't think Caliph can get a shot. Because one, two, three, four, plus he's got intervening terrain. So there will, in effect, be no Union combat turn. When that happens, you pick the next chit. Okay, the next chit pulled is the Confederate combat turn. And as you can see, with this magical chit pulling system, you really don't know what's going to go on. You might get a uh, movement turn, you might get a combat turn, Combat might occur when you don't really want it to. There's so much that can happen in this game. The interactivity is what makes this game really, really cool. So nothing happens there because there's no Confederates with the range to have combat. We draw another chit. There's only what, four chits left in there. We draw one and it happens to be... Oops, the initiative chit, that shouldn't be in there. Let's draw again. Oh, I, I bumped it off of turn 8. That's what I did. Okay, the next chit is the Artillery Reserve chit. Now, there is a unit of the Artillery Reserve coming on. That's this unit under Pegram. Pegram, as you can see on the counter, it says it arrives at 2B, which is the Chambersburg Pike. So we put Pegram on the Chambersburg Pike, 
and then only Pegram can move because that was the chip that was picked. Now this brings up some interesting little anomalies in the game. For example, because we uh, the chit order is so important, Pegram can move uh, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember, there's no stacking, so he gets actually caught in the traffic jam here of uh, Heath's division on the Chambersburg Pike, and can only in effect go seven. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. Depending on the chit order system, you might be get involved in a traffic jam on various roads. So that's the artillery reserve chit pulled. Pull the next chit. And that happens to be Heath's division. Now, that means Davis and Archer are going to be able to move, plus the new brigades of Pettigrew and Brockenborough, which are coming on. And, as fate would have it, they'll get caught in this traffic jam. Actually, no, they won't, because Davis and Archer will move. So let's catch the action after I've moved all of Heath's division. See what Heath is going to do. Okay, because Davis and Archer are now going to move into primary range, um, I'll film it as I move them because this really shows off the beautiful, the beauty of this system. So we'll move Davis up, and he'll go one, two, three, four. He's got to pay one for the slope, five, six. And he goes into primary range of Devon's cavalry. When you move into primary range, you move, these are remarkable little counters. They're well, well thought out. There's a firing side and a moving side. And since Davis is moving, you put the little wee counter to show that he's moving into primary range. Archer will now move. He'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. He also gains one of these wee markers. And there's a moving and a firing side. And you can orient them to wherever way you want. Um, as long as the blue shows that you're moving, you're fine. Now, Pegram is part of the artillery reserve, you remember. He's not part of Heath's division. So, um, yes, Brock and Bro and Pettigrew might get caught in a traffic jam. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whoops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Actually, they'll just pass through Pegram. So you get to get these little anomalies where, um, you know, historically that might not have happened. Again, with turns of an hour and 15 minutes, you can just justify, well, Pegram's guns pulled over to the side while the infantry moved in. No big deal. So that's the situation after Heath has moved. Now we're going to pull another chit. And you might say, hey, wait a minute, whoa, slow down, boy. Where's the combat? Well, you remember that we've already pulled the combat chits. So there will not be combat, even though we're adjacent. Again, the beauty of this system. We'll see how it works in a moment. So we pick our last chit, which we know has got to be the first core. So that means the Iron Brigade and Cutler will move, and these new units that are coming on the board too. So I'll place them on the board and catch the action after we've moved the first core. Okay, that's the Iron Brigade and Cutler up there on the Emmitsburg Road with another division following close behind, and I see Eric has done his research very well. They show his Biddle's Brigade coming in on this rather obscure road down near the covered bridge. I think it was called the Nunamaker Hill Road, and uh, it kind of wandered off to the um, west accidentally and got separated from the Corps, and that is accurately shown in the game. So that's the end of turn two. We'll go on to turn three. I'll place the turn three and turn four man on. We'll put the new chits in the cup and go from there. Okay, we note that on turn three, some new units come onto the battlefield, part of the 11th Corps under Howard. So we take Howard's chit, add it to the chits, and that goes in the cup. We'll pull one and we'll do turn three. Okay, before we pull any chits for turn three, that's the general situation. As you can see, we've got part of Heath's division engaged with Devon and Gamble. Another uh, a few brigades coming up the Chambersburg Pike and the first corps closing up on the Emmitsburg Road with that other brigade there too. Now here's the beauty of the chit pull system again. We don't know what's going to happen next. Will it be a combat turn, a movement turn, who's moving, who's fighting? Let's pull a chit and find out. Okay, the terminology for pulling these, what I call chits, is actually movement turn counters. So we'll pull one here, 
we don't know what's going to happen. But we pull Pleasanton's Cavalry Corps. Now that's an interesting situation. So I better explain this one a little bit here. So this means, of course, that Pleasanton's uh, units can move, Devon and Gamble. Now they're currently dismounted and they are adjacent to Confederate infantry. So they can just pull out if they want to. If they elect to stay, of course they're more or less inviting combat because the combat shit could come up at any time. So I've got a decision now whether Devon and Gamble are going to stay or pull out. And for the purposes of the video, I think I'll have them stay. And because uh, we want to see how combat works, and they've got to buy some time for Meredith and Cutler to come up there, the Iron Brigade. So, Devin and Gamble decide to not move. So, we'll pick the next chit, see what it is. Next chit happens to be a combat turn. Well, there you go. Now we have combat. And when you pull the combat chit of your color, in this case, Confederate means the Confederates will be the attacker. Now note that nobody's moving here. You don't move these units up and have combat. You just have combat with any units that are adjacent. So now we'll do our first combat. Okay, there's a strict order to combat. Now step number one technically is defending cavalry retreat before combat. But since we have dismounted cavalry, we don't have that option. Number two, the attacker would bombard, in this case Confederate but they don't have any artillery in position ready to bombard. So that step is lost. The third step is both sides perform approach fire. Now this one stumped me a little bit at first, but I forgot that with the interactivity of the chits, you could actually have movement and firing counters on Devon's and uh, Gamble's men too, had they moved into the Confederates. But in this case, we have the Confederates moving in on the Union. So the Union, in the approach fire phase, is going to get a free shot at Archer and a free shot at Davis because Davis and Archer are moving on them and the defender gets to fire first in this approach fire combat. Let's see how that combat goes. Okay, in the first combat we'll do is Gamble firing on Archer. Art and Gamble will fire five dice because his combat value is five. And Archer happens to be a member in clear terrain, which we've already looked at, which is the two to hit number is five. But when you're doing approach fire, there's a negative three or four, I think, to the combat result. Let me just check. Yeah, it's a negative three. So Gamble will roll five dice. I'll roll that now. And we'll see what he gets. Okay. Got a six, a six, a six, a nine, and a one. Okay, which in effect means He's only got a single hit. What do we do? Remember we put a hit marker on Archer temporarily. We can now remove this moving firing marker because he's already taken his penalty. Okay, Devon will now fire. He's going to be rolling four dice. Davis is still in clear terrain there. So we're going to roll four dice and Union will want to get a 1. And he rolls a 9, a 9, a 4, and a 0. So those are all misses by Devon. And that's the end of the approach fire. We'll take this little marker off. Now because Archer took a hit, remember he's going to have to check morale. So he will roll for morale, and he'll get to add 0 because his morale is 0. And a dice, and he rolls a three, which means he fails morale. And when you check the fail morale result in approach fire, I believe it's converted to a hit. Let me just check the rules. Yes, because Archer failed his morale, we take the hit marker off, and we put a three strength point marker under him to show that he's taken one hit. So that's kind of one full step lost, permanent loss this time, not temporary. And it specifically says that in the approach fire morale checks, units do not retreat. So Davis and Archer have to stay there now and battle it out with Devon and Gamble. Now I should have pointed out that uh, in step three, 
there was an optional attack and retreat before combat. In other words, if Davis and Archer didn't like the odds going against Devin and Gamble, they could have retreated. But that would be kind of silly in this instance because they closed for battle anyway. So the next step is we now resolve battle against each other, and that is simultaneous. In other words, you record all hits, then you do all morale checks, and you put the final markers down. So that's what we'll do. I'll do the combat um, rolls, and I'll show you the results after we've done the hits. So you'll understand, Gamble will still fire five dice against Archer, and Devon will fire four dice against Davis. And we don't have a case where they have to split fire. Actually, yes, we do. They do have to split fire. Just a moment here. Yes, because Archer is in the zone of control of two units, Archer will have to split his fire. And he's only got three strength points. So what he's going to do is roll two dice against Gamble, one dice against Devon. Davis will be able to roll all his dice against Davis. And uh, let's see. Devin can fight on, yeah, these guys can go one-on-one. -on -one. So I'll roll the dice and see what the combat results are. Okay, the net effect of that combat was that Gamble inflicted two hits on Archer, Devin inflicted two hits on Davis, and Davis inflicted three hits on Devin. But those hits have to be qualified, remember. You have to roll morale for each unit, and those units are converted to either uh, permanent strength point losses or possible retreats. So we'll follow the action after I rolled the morale for all three units. And we'll see what happens. Okay, luckily for Archer, he passed his morale check when he took those two hits. But those two hits are converted to demoralization points. So you add that to Archer. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that Archer is really in size a three, but two of those three strength points are demoralized and kind of out of the conflict. In short, Archer's pretty banged up. He's almost re uh, reached what we call brigade combat effectiveness in the old TSS system. He's pretty shot up and is going to need a rest. Let's see if uh, Davis passes his morale check. He rolls a four, which means he fails. Now when you fail a morale check, he's got two hits. The first hit is converted to a hit, and the second one to a demoralization. So he's now going to have two demoralization, and we have to get a seven marker for Davis. So Davis is chewed up a bit, but he's not doing too bad, since he's fairly large. Now, because Davis failed his morale check, he's got to retreat two squares, so he's going to go back. Davis, or rather Archer, got to stay, remember, because he passed his morale check. Let's check Devon's morale. He rolls a three, which means he fails. That's not good for Devon. What does that mean? Well, it means the first hit is converted to a permanent loss. The other two are taken as demoralization. Okay, so in effect, Devon is pretty shot up, too. He's only taken one loss, but he's got two demoralization. So that means he's got a three, but of those three, two of them are demoralized. So he's pretty bad shape. And because he failed his morale, he retreats two, here, uh, two hexes. One, two. So that's the end of combat round one. Now each combat is really consists of two rounds. So we'll go to the second round of combat and see what happens. Okay, you, stop, you follow the same steps you did in the first combat round. So, the defenders could retreat before combat if they were mounted, but Gamble isn't mounted, he's dismounted. But Archer is so shot up, I mean, he's, he's in really bad shape. Um, I think he's going to voluntarily retreat. He'll go back two squares, one, two. So that's the end of a typical combat round, and uh, it was rather exciting. Davis and Archer were roughly handled, but so was Devon and Gamble. They may have to mount up and get the heck out of there. Not sure yet. So, what we do is, with that combat round done, we mix up the chits, pull a chit, and see what happens. And we pull a First Corps Reynolds. Well, that means the units of the First Corps are going to move now. Let's see if the First Corps can come to the rescue. 
Now this gets really interesting because uh, though the Iron Brigade can get up there, where he'd like to be is really where Devon is. But remember, you can't stack in this game. It's strictly by the chit pull. So I can't decide whether to have the Iron Brigade cut across the fields here to Seminary Ridge or go through the town. Uh, maybe I'll do a compromise. Let's catch the action after I've moved the units of the First Corps. Okay, the First Corps moved the Iron Brigade to just the foot of Seminary Ridge. Cutler climbed the ridge and is over on the uh, Confederate right flank. And the rest of the First Corps came up. And the little straggling brigade there that was off on the New Newmaker Hill Road is heading towards the Emsburg Road. So the Union is concentrating fairly well. Let's see what the next chit pull will be. God knows what that will be. Pull a chit, and it is the Confederate Artillery Reserve. So that means only the Artillery Reserve can uh, move, which in this case will be the Battalion of uh, Pegram and uh, Macintosh. Macintosh comes on first. So, Macintosh is coming on, and Pegram will move. Interesting thing about the artillery in this game, you really have to think in advance and set it up, because when the combat chit is pulled, you want to get your batteries, hopefully you've moved them into position by then, so they can fire. Let's see what Pegram can do. Okay, Pegram decided to plant conservatively. He moved off to the right here on this ridge, so he can maybe take some long range bombardment shots, but uh, with the combat chit already um, thrown, that's not likely to happen. Poor old Macintosh got caught up in a traffic jam here be behind Pettigrew and Brockenborough. So not much happened there. Let's pick the next chit, see what happens. The next chit happens to be Howard's 11th Corps. So we'll move Howard's 11th Corps onto the board. Okay, that's uh, Howard's Corps coming on the board up from uh, Tawny Town. And uh, I forgot to move Stone, by the way. That was uh, another brigade that came on for the first corps. He just moved up the Emmitsburg Road. So, uh, as you can see, I've been studying the Battle of Gettysburg for a long time. And uh, if the game has it right, you can see that Meade is concentrating, at this hour anyway, almost faster than Robert E. Lee's men. Still one shit left in the cup. Pardon me, there's two. Got shit. And we get the... Heath's division. So, Heath can move. That's Devon, uh, Davis and Archer and Brockenborough and Pettigrew. Now, boy, they've got some decisions to make because Archer and Davis are pretty chewed up. Brockenborough and uh, Pettigrew can probably get in, though. And Pettigrew is one big brigade. Good quality, too. Um, I'll probably be aggressive and move them in. Let's catch the action after we've moved the Confederates. Okay, Pettigrew and Brockenborough moved right into primary range of Gamble, and you may remember we marked them with these moving firing markers. So um, they've got something going on here. Looks pretty good. And I might have made a mistake with Gamble, because Gamble is caught now, dismounted. Anyway, we have one more chip left to pull in the um, cup. And the last chit is the Union combat turn. So we follow all the same steps that we would in a normal combat turn, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, it's not as bad as I thought, but it's still going to be iffy, because it's going to depend on a die roll. Gamble can retreat before combat, even though he's dismounted, because he's not facing any Confederate cavalry. But he has to do a morale check, and if he passes, he may retreat before combat. If he fails, he's stuck. So as far as the Union is concerned, they're hoping to get um, greater than five on the dice here. Let's see what Gamble rolls. And he rolls a zero, which is a ten in this game, which means he can retreat before combat. That's very good for Gamble. Now, since he wants to eventually mount up and get back to his horses, he'll go back two squares to here. That's the retreat before combat. And the rules state that the attackers, the Confederates in this case, may not advance after combat because the Confederate is, uh, the cavalry rather, is considered to be screening the infantry against the infantry. So these markers can come up, can come off since we're not going to be doing the approach combat. And that ends another turn. 
and we'll set up turn four. Okay, on turn four, a new division comes onto the battlefield, Penders. So we take Penders Chit, and we add it to the uh, cup, along with all the other chits. And as you can see, now there's a whole mess of chits in there, representing all the formations that are currently on the battlefield. And, of course, the combat ones. So we'll draw a chit, and we'll see what happens. Again, that's the beauty of this system. You have no idea what's going to happen. Will it be combat? Will it be movement? Who knows? Let's draw a chit and find out. The all-important first draw of a new turn. And we draw the 11th core. So that means Howard's 11th core will move. We'll catch the action after Howard. Okay, that's the 11th core moving up here. I tilt the counters just uh, for my own use to show that I've moved them. Although you don't have a problem with this chit pulling system. If you don't pull the chit, you don't move the men. And the 11th Corps is moving up, and they got caught in a traffic jam here behind the stone. They couldn't move their full. So, we'll pull a chit, and see what happens. The next chit pulled is... Heath's Division. Well, uh, remember that's movement, not combat. So, let's see what Heath's Division can do. Because Pettigrew, uh, Pettigrew and Brockenborough are in pretty good positions there. Okay, because of the vagaries of the chit pull, with Devon moving before Devon and Gamble, um, or rather the Confederates moving before Devon and Gamble, uh, I've made a mistake here, which is the way you learn the game. I now know that if you dismount your cavalry, you better make darn sure your horses are in a safe position, which in this case they're not. Checking the rules, if Brockenborough puts a zone of control on Devon's horses, the horses are immediately eliminated and taken off from the board. So you put that over on the eliminated chart over there. And unfortunately, Devon loses a strength point and he's lost his horses. So all that cost the Confederates nothing. Let me just adjust the Devon marker there. Okay, well that move is rather serious because as you can now see, Devin has been reduced to two strength points, and two of those are demoralized. So he's like 50% shot up. He's in a really, really bad way. So um, watch out when you uh, have uh, dismounted cavalry. So Devin really becomes just kind of like an infantry unit now, and he's, um, he's in bad trouble. And I haven't even moved Heath yet. Not sure what Brockenborough are going to do. They might close in on Caliph, try to hit that battery, or maybe hit uh, Gamble. Hmm. Let's see what they can do. Okay, Heath's division decided to be very aggressive. They closed in, and of course we marked them with the uh, moved fire markers. Archer, though, is pretty shot up, and I could have moved him adjacent to Caliph, but I was worried about Caliph in defensive fire, if he gets to do so, might really wreck up uh, Archer, so he played it conservative as he's pretty shot up. So uh, we've marked it and we pull the next chit and see what happens. Anyman's game. Uh oh, well, this is not going to be too good for the Union. The Confederates got a combat turn, which now means the Confederates will perform combat down the line uh, and maybe the Union will retreat before combat. I'll have to check the rules on that for dismounted cavalry. Oh yes, they will be able to retreat before combat, but they will have to uh, do a morale die roll. Remember, if they fail, they're stuck. If they pass, they get to retreat. So let's follow the action after I've done the retreat before combat rules for uh, Devon and Gamble. And Caliph too, by the way. Uh, they qualify as uh, cavalry. Okay, the Union did fairly well. Gamble and Caliph both retreated before combat, but I'm afraid that old uh, Devon here got stuck. So we'll have to do approach fire for um, these two brigades. And uh, let's see how that goes. Okay, Devon won't have that much of a shot. He's only got two strength points that are effective, and he must divide them between two targets and they're in uh, clear terrain for one and in woods for the other. 
So the to hit number for Pettigrew, well, we know that the uh, union has to roll a 1 to hit Pettigrew. We roll, rolls a 5, no good. And his other strength point will go against Brock and Burl. Has to roll a 1, rolls a 7, no good. So the approach fire is done. And now these two units and uh, De Devon will engage again in regular combat. Pettigrew is going to be able to throw eight dice against Devon. Brockenborough is going to be able to throw three. So we'll follow the action after I've assigned all the hits. Okay, well that really wrecked up Devon. Devon though was able to inflict one hit on um, Davis. Whoops, what's that? Yeah. Oh, that, that's off. Okay, uh, he got one hit on Pettigrew and one hit on Brockenborough. But the Confederates managed to get six hits on Devon. So we have to roll morale and see how those hits are converted into either disorganization points or permanent losses. Let's see what happens. Okay, that's the situation after the uh, hits have been taken. Pettigrew failed his morale and took a strength point loss and had to retreat. Brockenborough passed his morale and actually advanced. Oh, that can't be right. That's seven demoralization. I have to check that. Yeah, uh, Brockenborough got a one demoralization, but he did advance. And Devon got so many losses, he shattered. And he's down to one single strength point, and he has to go to the shattered union box way over there on the upper right side. And there's a chance of him coming back perhaps in the evening. So he's kind of out of the battle. Now we notice that Brock and Burrow advanced, and I'll have to check the rules now for what happens for the second round, because he's now adjacent to a uh, union unit. Okay, Brockenborough doesn't really have to attack because there's an attack uh, retreat option. So, um, also he didn't have to advance either. He doesn't want to engage with the Iron Brigade that would be throwing six dice at him. So he'll be content with just staying back there. That ends the combat round. So, um, we've got a shattered unit and uh, the Confederates are in a little bit better position now, but the Union are concentrating fast. Let's draw for the next chit, see what it is. And the next chit is... That's the Artillery Reserve Confederate, so that's Pegram and McIntosh will be moving next. Okay, Pegram decided to move up here to the um, Hagerstown Road to guard the right flank and maybe get some long-range shots if the Union comes up on the Seminary Ridge. And McIntosh moved right up to the front, being very bold. Let's draw the next chit, see what happens. We've drawn the Cavalry Corps. Well, I think it's about time for Gamble and Caliph to get the heck out of there. So I think uh, he's going to mount up and clear the area. It's now an infantry fight. Okay, it costs Cavalry three movement points to mount up, so that's what Gamble did. He mounted up along with Caliph and just moved to the east side of Gettysburg. Uh, you don't want to keep your cavalry around infantry much. Uh, he's done his job. He's given time for the Union First Corps to come up, so he can just go and wreck an order for a little while. Let's draw the next chit, see what's happening. The next chit is the First Corps. So let's catch the action after I've moved all the units of the First Corps. Okay, that's after the First Corps has moved. They formed a nice line here on the Seminary Ridge. Should point out that the color coding of the counters is just fantastic with the little colored band for each core, plus there is the core designation right there in the middle. First, you always know who's who. Very clean counters and very easy to move. So that's the Union First Core. Let's pull another chit, see what we've got. We've got a Union Combat. Now, I don't think the Union will have any combat. Because they're artillery, you know, there's no bombardment, they're not adjacent. So there's no real Union combat turn. We'll pick the last chit, which happens to be Pender's division. That's that new division that comes up from the Chambersburg. So we'll move it and end the turn. Okay, that's the strategic situation after we've finished the turn for a turn. The Confederates are doing fairly well. They're advancing on Gettysburg. 
Pender coming up the pike, and the Union is concentrating quite nicely too. Now if you get the impression that I'm in love with this system, you'd be totally correct. I really like this chit-pull brigade level system. Let's go on to turn 5 and let's see what happens. Okay, for turn 5, there won't be any new movement or uh, chits added, but uh, Coster and Smith are coming on, and Garnett from Heath's division, and um, Pogue, part of Pender's division. Again, the color coding very handy. Pogue being with a white band, you can see that Pender's got a white band. So, uh, the counter sortation, the way they've done the counters, is very well done. So we'll put the chits back in the pot and draw and see what happens. Okay, the first chit pull of a new turn is always exciting because you never know what the devil's going to happen. Would be a combat turn, uh, who's going to move. Very exciting system. Okay, we've pulled the chit and the winner is Pender's Division. Okay, Pender will just simply move up the pike then and join the front. Okay, some of Pender's lead brigades were in range to hit the Iron Brigade, but I decided I better be careful, so I just moved Pender up as far as I can, up the pike. Let's draw another chit and uh, let's see what's going on. Okay, we draw the Artillery Reserve chit. That means Macintosh and Pegram can move. They're not in bad positions, but... Um, Pegram could get into a better firing position. So I think he will. He'll move up McPherson's Ridge here, and I'll tilt him just to remind myself that I moved him. And um, depending on what happens, you know, he's still below the ridge. I hate to have him go into primary. Uh, let me rethink that for a moment. Okay, Pegram will move over here to McPherson's Ridge. McIntosh isn't in a really bad position, but he's got Forrest blocking him there. Could have a nice shot at the Iron Brigade. But I'm going to take a chance and move him over to the left flank a little bit. So three, four, five, six. Taking a little bit of a chance having artillery all by itself there, but uh, let's try it. Anyway, next chip pull. Pull. And that's Pleasanton again. Well, he's doing his job way over there east of Gettysburg, but I'll fan him out on the roads. Um, he's really out of the conflict, but let's have him watch this road here, and we'll have Caleb up here. Your cavalry should be used for reconnaissance. They shouldn't be engaging with infantry, so he's doing his job. Okay, we pull another chit. And uh, let's see who's moving next. Uh-huh, combat turn. Wow, a Confederate combat turn. So it was... Whoops, you know what? I've got Pegram down in a gully there. He can't see anybody. I got uh, fooled into thinking... Oh, no, that is a ridge. Huh, let's look at this terrain. Anyway, McIntosh will be able to do a bombardment. So we're going to see a bombardment against the Iron Brigade. Now, bombardment, we've done once before. You check the range, and bombardment range is a minus three to the two hit number. Now, the two hit number usually is a five. So we'll have to roll a one or a two. And okay, we had an interruption there because my um, iPad ran out of memory. I'm shooting this on the on the iPad for the first time, so apologies for the interruption. Anyway, um, we left off with Macintosh here bombarding the Iron Brigade at uh, 2x range. They will be rolling three dice, and they need to roll a one or two to get a hit. And they get one hit on the Iron Brigade, like so. We mark it, and the Iron Brigade has to check morale. He checks morale, but he will be adding three because. Uh, the Iron Brigade's a good brigade. And he gets a 9, which he, he, is, uh, he passes his morale. And when you bombard at long range and the enemy passes his morale, there's no effect. I really like the way the artillery works in this uh, game. So, we're at probably 58, 59, close to one hour of video here. Uh, 
I'll end this first part. So we're kind of in the middle of the noon turn, still drawing chits. So I'll post this video, call it part one, and then I'll commence shooting part two of the uh, battle hen. I hope you're enjoying the um, the playthrough. It's not my usual thing to do playthroughs, but uh, this is such an enjoyable game and such an enjoyable system. I thought it deserved uh, a more fuller account. And uh, I think at some future time I would like to do a video of P Ridge also. So that's the end of part one. And, uh, you know, for those of you who aren't going to go on to part two uh, in closing, I think this is a really good brigade system for the Civil War. Um, yeah, I'll commit myself. This is now my favorite brigade level Civil War game on the Battle of Gettysburg. Anyway, let's post this and then I'll begin shooting part two. Thank you for watching.